Good evening to everyone, or good morning, good afternoon for non-European colleagues, and welcome to the ISHLT Pathology Professional Community Webinar. I'm Francesca Lunardi from the University of Padova in Italy, and pathology representative of the Early Career and Trainee Committee of the ISHLT. First of all, I would like to thank you all for registering, as well as ISHLT for giving me the opportunity to share this very interesting webinar entitled Surprise, Surprise, Unexpected Diagnosis in Heart and Lung Transplantation. I would like to give you only a few information about these webinars. The 10 ISHLT professional communities are the gathering place for the professional specialties that makes up the care teams for our patients. Each IHSLT professional community is represented on the four ISHLT interdisciplinary steering committees, advanced high failure and transplantation, advanced lung failure and transplantation, mechanical circulatory support, and pulmonary vascular disease. The ISHLT professional community webinars are free and open to all with an interest. If you are not a member of ISHLT, please consider joining this uh, unique international interdisciplinary society. And if you are already a member, thank you for making this organization what it is. If you would like to join or get more involved in ISHLT, you can contact anyone at ISHLT headquarters through the website. But coming back to this webinar, it started from an idea of a great pathologist, Tazania Roden and took shape thanks to the collaboration and valuable inputs of the ISHLT pathology community leaders. And we hope that you will enjoy the format. Indeed, the three young pathologists will present interesting cases and they will discuss with world-recognized pathologists involved in heart and lung transplantation. Now, I would leave the word to my co-chair, Gregory Fishbein, a great pathologist of the UCLA University and pathology community representative in the Advanced Heart Failure and Transplantation Interdisciplinary Steering Committee. Please, Greg. Thank you, Francesca. Uh, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the first case. I'm going to introduce the first presenter right now, Daniel Stefanko, who is from the uh, University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, Dr. Stefanko received his medical education at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles where he also earned a PhD in neuroscience. Uh, in 2022, he completed his residency training in anatomic and clinical pathology at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, he is currently completing a fellowship in cardiothoracic pathology here at UCLA, and is currently actually on rotation at the Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale, Arizona. Upon completion of this fellowship, Dr. Stefanko uh, will be pursuing fellowship training in gastrointestinal and liver pathology here at UCLA. Uh, and uh, without further ado, I will, uh, you can begin the first case. Dr. Stefanko, please. Great, thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for allowing me to present here. So uh, hopefully you all can see my, my slides. Uh, I'm gonna be presenting uh, an unexpected finding in a post heart transplant surveillance biopsy. Uh, so patient is a uh, now 22 year old uh, female whose uh, cardiac history basically started when she was at age 11 when she was out at a uh, restaurant with her family and collapsed and had a sudden cardiac arrest. Uh, she was resuscitated and admitted to an outside hospital where she was found to have severe dilated cardiomyopathy with the left ventricular uh, measurement at approximately eight centimeters. Uh, she remained there for a little less than a month when she was then transferred to UCLA, uh, essentially due to her inability to wean off of her IV meds. And so she was transferred to, to determine whether she was a candidate for a uh, heart transplant at that time. Uh, and uh, in doing so, she was deemed a good candidate and she was listed as status two, but, uh, and had a, 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 an AICD placed uh, about a couple of weeks later. Uh, but in the interim of waiting for uh, a suitable donor, she actually improved and she was able to be able to be weaned off of her ionotropes. And uh, ultimately serial uh, echoes and a cardiac cath uh, about a week after uh, defibrillator replacement 
showed that she had what was deemed to be an acceptable uh, cardiac output with her EFs ranging uh, around 20%. And with that, she was able to be discharged home and she was placed uh, on an active status. And she remained that way for uh, about nine years or so with serial echoes ranging from 20 to 25% for her EF. Uh, she then presented in 2021 in early January to uh, Kaiser, which is where she was uh, mostly seen at that time with uh, increasing fatigue, shortness of breath and dyspnea over the previous month. And uh, ultimately the echo at the outside facility showed worsening ventricular function with uh, now a decrease in her EF about 10 to 15%, uh, a new uh, pretty severe mitral regurgitation uh, and an interval increase in the size of her left ventricle. Uh, so ultimately she was uh, referred again back to UCLA for reconsideration of heart transplant. And she was admitted uh, at the very beginning of February, so uh, February 3rd. Uh, at the time, uh, this is her, her chest X-ray and you can see a, a pretty massively dilated uh, uh, heart with cardiomegaly. Uh, and you can also see her uh, AICD here with the leads going uh, what appear to be into the left ventricle uh, correctly. Uh, uh, this is a screenshot of her echo, uh, again, showing a pretty uh, dilated heart uh, with the left ventricle now measuring about 10 centimeters. So uh, she was listed for heart transplant uh, after uh, validating that she, again, was a good candidate. And a suitable donor was identified in, uh, about a month later, and she, went under, uh, she underwent uh, transplant at that time. Uh, and she did well. Uh, she was one of our patients that was discharged in less than two weeks. She had two biopsies prior to her discharge. Both of them uh, showed no evidence of rejection, either on cellular or uh, antibody mediated. Uh, so here's a picture of her explant. Again, uh, kind of reiterating that it was, uh, this is our unfixed on the uh, external view showing a pretty large heart here. Uh, on internal, we see uh, dilation of the left ventricle as well, uh, but we don't see really any uh, overt gross evidence of fibrosis. Uh, slides were taken, as you can kind of see from the left ventricle here from the interventricular septum uh, in multiple areas. And histologically, there was uh, some multiple foci of uh, sub-endocardial, so or endomyocardial, so here's the endocardium here at the bottom right, uh, fibrosis. And going closer, these areas of fibrosis uh, essentially are uh, kind of bland fibrosis in that there, there's no uh, mononuclear or uh, immune infiltrate that is associated with it. So we just see uh, fibrosis in these areas. Uh, moving on, uh, multiple uh, follow-up visits, the patient was continuing to do well. Uh, one routine follow-up uh, about eight months later, uh, post-transplant uh, in November, she showed up normal state of health. Uh, one thing that she did note, there was a miscommunication of her uh, medication where she was told to take seven of tacrolimus, and so she took seven pills when she really should have taken seven milligrams. And so uh, each of those pills being 0.5 milligrams, she took essentially half of her regular dosage. And this was reflected on her uh, labs where her level decreased from 8.3 the prior month to now, uh, which was in within uh, therapeutic range to now being only 1.5 uh, and the, this, um, in her surveillance labs that was done at the time of her presentation. Uh, in addition, uh, labs also showed her BMP uh, increased uh, again from the prior month uh, being 66 to now being 255 uh, in, uh, on these, uh, again, routine labs at that time. And so she was admitted essentially with concern for acute rejection due to her being, um, uh, having a, a, a suboptimal dose of her tacrolimus. Um, and so she had an endomyocardial biopsy that was performed uh, the day after her admission. 
And here is a low power view of that where we see a mononuclear cell infiltrate in the endocardium here uh, and here as well, uh, consistent with the quilty lesion. Uh, but in addition to that, we see a, a fairly diffuse uh, 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 inflammatory infiltrate uh, in the myocardium itself. And uh, even from low power, it, it, it kind of points out that it may be a little bit red here, but if we go closer, we could see that there's quite a few eosinophils here, which uh, again was unexpected from based on her history uh, uh, for us to find here. So she was given the diagnosis of eosinophilic myocarditis uh, on this biopsy. Um, she had a, an echocardiogram uh, uh, post biopsy that showed a, an EF of 72%. Uh, and she was basically started on a pregnisone taper. And uh, again, uh, she was essentially asymptomatic the entire time, but uh, she was started at 50 milligrams and that was tapered over a seven day period, also given IVIG. And ultimately, uh, again, since she never really had any symptoms after her taper was finished, she was discharged uh, and continued to be in good health uh, thereafter. Uh, of note, she, she has had uh, multiple admissions for acute rejection after that episode. Um, in uh, the end of May of last year, uh, she had a biopsy that was uh, that showed 2R. Uh, subsequent biopsies, including the one from the beginning of July, showed an AMR uh, one with histologic findings, uh, but with no immunopathologic AMR. Um, and ultimately, again, she she continues to do well even up till today. Um, her last follow up visit was at the beginning of the of uh, this month still, since it's still February. Um, but uh, again, never really had any symptomatic uh, with uh, episodes, just uh, uh, episodes with her, her labs and uh, on biopsies. Uh, so that concludes uh, the discussion of the case. I can give it back over to Dr. Fishbein to um, introduce the discussant. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Um, so now I'll, I'll, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dylan Miller from the University of Utah. Uh, Dr. Miller is a professor of pathology at the University of Utah School of Medicine in Salt Lake City uh, in the USA and practices in a private group at the Intermountain Medical Center in Salt Lake City. He and his colleagues provide pathology support for the Collaborative Utah Cardiac Transplant Program, uh, UTAH that is. He participated and helped author the 2010 and 2013 ISHLT working formulations for antibody-mediated rejection in the heart. Dr. Miller served on ISHLT's annual meeting program planning committee for the 2015, 2016, and 2023 meetings, uh, and was chair of the Pathology Council in 2013 and 2014. He co-edits a cardiovascular pathology textbook that is now in its third edition and is an active member of the Society of Cardiovascular Pathology and the Association for European Cardiovascular Pathology. And with that, I will turn the discussion over to Dr. Miller. It's better when you unmute, right? Well, Dr. Stefanko, that was a great case presentation um, and really an interesting case. I think there are many issues, I, um, especially about why that first, uh, or the explant pathology and why the first graph failed, but I'm gonna dutifully stick to the task at hand and talk about the uh, biopsy findings, um, especially the eosinophilia in a, in a post-transplant biopsy. Really the topic that raises is, um, let's we get this to advance. The question of recurrent myocarditis versus rejection in the post-transplant setting. Is this an allograft eosinophilic myocarditis or is this rejection with eosinophils? When it comes to the whole topic of recurrent myocarditis with lymphocytic or mixed pattern, that's a really thorny issue. And we could talk about autoimmune versus alloimmune response and what's driving the lymphocytes to attack the donor myocardium. But with eosinophilic myocarditis, I think it's a little more straightforward. That's clearly not a T-cell mediated alloimmune response. 
if it's a predominantly eosinophilic process. So I'm just going to kind of address both of these possibilities. Um, things that would point towards an eosinophilic myocarditis, whether it's recurrent or even theoretically de novo, would be looking back at if there was a biopsy done before transplant uh, and what that initial diagnosis was. So knowing the history is really critical here. Also the clinical picture in terms of if the patient had peripheral eosinophilia, if there was evidence of other hypersensitivity type uh, features in the patient. Um, thinking about what could have incited such a response, looking at ch recent changes to medications or exposures to new allergens or antigens that previously um, the patient hadn't been exposed to, and even considering the possibility of some kind of parasitic infection for a reason of having increased um, eosinophils. And I think um, the very thorough case presentation, it didn't really seem like we had um, any of these uh, factors going on in this case. In terms of the question of can you have eosinophils with uh, rejection, this is the uh, 2005 paper looking at cellular rejection of, of heart transplantation, re revising the 1990 working formulation. And several, um, if you search for eosinophils in this paper, it crops up several times in both mild and moderate grade 2R rejection. There's statements about eosinophils may be present. I think we can disregard the perioperative ischemic injury where you can also see eosinophils, but given the, the later course of this patient, we could rule that out. But I, I will point out that is another uh, situation where you could see eosinophils. There isn't any mention in the AMR working formulation paper from ISHLT, but in this wet online tutorial that was a combined effort of the Society for Cardiovascular Pathology and the Euro European uh, Cardiac Society, um, it does talk about eosinophils being present in, in AMR and also in cellular rejection. And in fact, um, kind of a section on what to do when you see eosinophils, that you can certainly see them in rejection, um, especially this says in more moderate episodes, and um, you can see them in hypersensitivity myocarditis. So I, I don't know that we can be 100% certain what, why these eosinophils are there, but this would be the differential. And I think given that she didn't have new medications, new allergen exposures, uh, I, I don't think she had peripheral eosinophilia. I think I'd lean more towards this being an example of prominent eosinophils as part of a component of cardiac transplant rejection. So look forward to some discussion about this. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. Uh, anything from the chat? I think maybe I'll, I'll kick it off and ask you uh, just a question in general about eosinophilic myocarditis. This is something that comes up as dinner table discussion and for me, how many eosinophils do you need to have to cause something eosinophilic myocarditis? Yeah, that, I, I don't have a strict criteria. I mean, I, I like to see more of them than anything else, but admittedly that's that's a uh, very subjective in its diagnosis. What, how about you? I mean, I think the majority of cells being eosinophils is my, is my criterion. I see Dr. Goddard has his hand raised. Thanks, Greg. Uh, great presentation, really interesting case. Um, I agree. I think I tend to see eosinophils more as a component of cellular rejection, and they raise antibodies in myself. Uh, I get worried when I see them. Eosinophils are not kind to myocytes on the whole, so I, <laughs> I tend to get worried about them. I was intrigued to see, and maybe Daniel would wish to comment, well, maybe he wouldn't wish to comment, um, that they used IVIG as part of the therapeutic regime. Now, I think where you've got evidence of clear lymphocyte-mediated damage, then I think there's a good case for using IVIG. But usually eosinophils are really quite steroid responsive. And it, it did seem to me to be quite, a, quite a, an aggressive regimen. Now, we may not be the right group of people to actually discuss that. Um, uh, but, but that was a, I don't really recognize the eosinophils too much within antibody mediated direction, rejection, but I do recognize they've been, I 
identified and it tends to push me towards a more mixed pattern when I see them. Um, so that's really um, where I am in, in thinking about the case, but it is very interesting. Um, and I agree, I think this is more likely to be rejection related than to be recurrent disease of some sort. I see in the chat, uh, the question is, what was the immunosuppression at the time of presumed eosinophilic myocarditis, steroid dose? Can we presume if adequately immunosuppressed, it is related to rejection? So Daniel, I don't know if you want to comment. Yeah, so, so going back, uh, I, think, I think the one bit of, uh, the, of history that I was able to, to kind of toy out that, that really uh, is, is important in here is that she was essentially under uh, immunosuppressed at the time of this biopsy where due to that kind of miscommunication uh, that she was taking essentially half of her dose of, of Tacro and her level had decreased substantially uh, and, and outside of the therapeutic range uh, at that time as well. So I think that also leads to, to, to some speculation that this was a part of rejection as well. Uh, and her BNP had, had also uh, similarly increased during that, that time period as well. Any other comments? Uh, no, or... I would agree. I think, I think whatever the acidophils are doing there, they're compromising cardiac function. I mean, we have a clear correlation there. And therefore, I think it's entirely appropriate that treatment strategies should be devised about getting the eosinophils out of the graph and steroids tend to be the most effective way to do that um but why they're there yes the immunosuppressant is low but that's a very odd pattern that eosinophilic predominance within there is is quite an unusual pattern you know uh, i mean so i i am intrigued by it without doubt it's a fascinating case thank you I see another question uh, from Dr. Lutheringer. Was there any molecular testing thoughts to attempt to rule out rejection? Uh, I did not see any molecular testing being done. And, and also to, to comment uh, on one other thing before, uh, she did not have uh, peripheral eosinophilia. Um, I think that was one other thing that came up. Uh, I'll just comment that at UCLA, at least we're not using molecular microscope in our adult population at this moment. Uh, we, we do use the molecular microscope routinely um, in our pediatric population. All right, well, I think then that was an excellent discussion. I think then I'll, I'll turn the, the discussion back to Dr. Nulardi. Nulardi. Yes, indeed, after this really intriguing case, let's move to the second presenter, who is Vanati Sivasur Brahmanian. Uh, Dr. Vanati Sivasur Brahmanian completed her medical degree at the University of Queensland in Australia and obtained her fellowship in anatomical pathology in 2011. Her specialist training was predominantly at St. Vincent Hospital in Sydney, where she has continued to work as a staff specialist since 2011. Her areas of subspecialty expertise include cardiovascular and pleuropulmonary pathology, mediastinal pathology, cytopathology, head and neck, and medical renal pathology. She's also a registrar supervisor for the Royal College of Pathologists of Australasia, and she has a lead role in the training of other pathologists in Australia and New Zealand in PDL1 immunohistochemistry in osmal cell lung carcinomas. And she's also a member of the RCPA quality assurance team assessing national laboratory PDL1 staining. So let's uh, hear about uh, the case. Please, Vanati, you can start. Vanati, we cannot hear you. Hopefully you can hear me now, my apologies. Um, 
So uh, yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to speak today. Uh, it's a, a, a great privilege uh, to be speaking with uh, um, some of the uh, sorry, uh, experienced uh, pathologists in lung transplantation and heart transplantation. Um, the case I'm presenting today is a 56 year old uh, female. I don't think we um, can see your screen anymore. We were, we were able to see it, but then it stopped. My apologies. Hopefully that's working all together. And you can hear me and see me. My apologies again. Um, uh, so yes, it's a 56 year old patient, uh, a female who had uh, bilateral lung transplantation. She had a 30 year pack history for her smoking. Her, um, the pathology of her uh, explant uh, lungs were unremarkable, showed by severe bilateral emphysema. She had an incidental thymoma, which was noted pre-op and operated at the time with a type AB thymoma. And her previous surgical history um, was fairly unremarkable. Uh, unfortunately, the patient had a, quite a rocky post-operative course uh, from day one. Um, it was noted on her first uh, day one uh, imaging, she had uh, a op complete opacity of the left lung. And it was uh, at 48 hours, it was diagnosed that she had a, a left pulmonary vein, was noted to be kinked on echocardiogram and she had vascular reanastomosis uh, at the time. Um, and during surgery for the reanastomosis, the lung uh, on the left in particular was noted to be hemorrhagic and slightly thickened. And she then uh, continued to have a downhill course with some worsening respiratory cardiovascular, hepatic and renal function. And she developed a, a significant thrombocytopenia over the next week. Um, at, on day nine, the diagnosis of HITS, which is heparin induced uh, thrombocytopenia and uh, thrombosis, um, was made both because of a positive heparin antibody uh, result with the ELISA and the SRA, and also um, duplex scans, which revealed multiple peripheral thrombi within the upper and lower limb vessels. Um, and at the time, an inferior vena cava filter was positioned and appropriate treatment was started. Um, however, the patient continued to deteriorate despite maximal therapy, therapy and she went into progressive multi-organ failure. Um, and although a pneumonectomy was planned, it was prevented by sudden cardiovascular deterioration and death actually occurred on uh, day 19 post-op. Uh, and the initial, uh, so the macroscopic findings uh, at autopsy, um, the most salient features, she had a black necrotic eschar along the recent uh, the, at clamshell incision, um, and that was extending into the surrounding soft tissues. Her, her lungs were heavy and congested, uh, quite, there was hepatization and uh, most of the left lung was quite necrotic and hemorrhagic. Um, and the, the right lung in particular in the upper lobe, there was a, quite a significant 200 mil clot overlying the upper lobe. Um, a examination of the larger vessels uh, and smaller vessels all showed macroscopically visible um, uh, multiple thrombi, including the, the, the major pulmonary vessels, the left subclavian auxiliary, left auxiliary, left internal and external jugular veins, the left internal thoracic vessel, the left common uh, internal iliac vessels and the smaller neck vessels. Her heart uh, was 360 grams, which is only slightly enlarged and she had a significant fibrinous pericardial ex exudate overlying um, the pericardium, didn't have much of a pericardial effusion and macroscopically the uh, myocardium appeared uh, unremarkable. Her liver was uh, um, uh, about normal size, was 1,460 grams, but it had a significant nutmeg appearance, was quite congested. Both of her kidneys, which were normal size, looked quite pale and mottled. Um, and she was noted the upper gastrointestinal tract appeared unremarkable, but I did find uh, multiple uh, hemorrhagic ulcers, both within uh, the large bowel and uh, as far down as the rectum. 
Uh, she note, was noted to have hemorrhage around the head of the pancreas. Um, there was some cystitis, hemorrhage uh, focally in the wall of the uterus and posterior aorta was quite hemorrhagic uh, as well. Um, from a point of view of the microscopic findings, um, the lungs were by far the most uh, impressive, but she had significant microscopic changes. So uh, her lungs were quite necrotic and hemorrhagic, and um, that was most of the left lobe and at least 50% of the right lobe. And what she did have was a diffuse fungal infection uh, by these non-septate, quite irregular broad uh, hyphae and they were present within most of the vascular thrombi and extended out uh, in, with angioinvasion into the adjacent uh, tissue. Um, the bronchial and the vascular anastomoses are macroscopically and microscopically appeared intact. There was no wound dehiscence, but the submucosal and surrounding tissues did show quite a few fungal organisms. Um, this is a low power view of the left pulmonary artery uh, and you can see the large thrombus and the surrounding lung which was quite necrotic and hemorrhagic and uh, these are a uh, high power view of the pulmonary artery with the thrombus and you can see uh, even on H&E uh, the uh, fungal organisms which are highlighted on the methanamine silver stain uh, with quite a regular broad um, ribbon-like. And this is a low power view of the right upper low bronchial artery, which had a large thrombus. Um, and I will show you on the higher power, the fungus, and this, as you can see, quite significant adjacent to necrosis. Um, and this uh, is the right upper lobe, that's a, a closer view of that uh, bronchial artery with the methanamine silver stain. And again, a higher power view, quite broad, um, ribbon-like organisms and prominent angioinvasion highlighted nicely on the methanamine silver stain. The heart uh, showed a significant fibrinous uh, pericarditis and there were fungal organisms that were present in the pericardial vessels. They, uh, you could see them tracking down and extending into the outer sort of one third of the myocardium and there was associated patchy myocyte necrosis um, the coronary arteries, uh, which only showed mild atherosclerosis in one of the vessels, all contained fungal organisms, but no significant thrombi. Um, and this is a picture of the pericardial vessel. Uh, and you can see even on uh, H&E, the, uh, the, the multiple hyphae, uh, hyphae within the uh, vessel. Uh, this is the H&E of the myocardium, but I think the features are actually better highlighted on this dipass stain, where you can see the organisms um, infiltrating through the myocardium with uh, patchy necrosis. And again, on the methanamine silver stain, which um, highlights the, the morphology of the organism. And you can see the outline of what was a vessel, um, the organisms uh, filling that vessel and then extending out. And again here, um, coming in down through the, the vessels. Uh, the peripheral vessels uh, that we saw them that I saw macroscopic uh, uh, thrombi all showed extensive uh, fungal infection within the thrombi, and there was necrosis and hemorrhage of the surrounding tissues. And the kidneys um, showed uh, large areas of infarction, and uh, there were numerous fungal uh, organisms within the glomeruli, within the tubules, and within the thrombi. So this is the left internal uh, thoracic artery. And you can see there um, a low power thrombus and a high power organisms uh, within the thrombus. And this is a dipass stain of a uh, small of renal arteriole and glomeruli. And you can see uh, numerous organisms throughout, uh, curled up even within the glomeruli, highlighted on the dipass stain. The aorta uh, showed normal, numerous fungi extending through the wall and they were wrapped through into the posterior vessels and actually wrapped all through the little nerves and the soft tissue with infarction. Um, the gastrointestinal tract, as I, uh, the, what I saw macroscopically, uh, showed full, um, uh, there was extensive ulceration of the mucosa and the submucosal vessels. The pancreas showed acute pancreatitis uh, and fu uh, fungal organisms in the vessels near the head. Um, and the liver showed centrolobular congestion, but I uh, couldn't actually isolate or show evidence of any fungal organisms in any of the sections we took. Uh, and this is just uh, a, 
uh, methanamine silver stains through the left colon. Um, and as you can see, there is significant necrosis and ulceration and um, organisms which can be identified all the way through the wall. Um, at the time, uh, during uh, the two weeks post-op, uh, her post-op uh, uh, progress, she had multiple respiratory samples, uh, which uh, I did not isolate any significant pathogens. However, the BAL performed two days prior to her death, um, which unfortunately grew organisms um, uh, around the time, just or after her death, and also the pleural fluid and lung tissue that we obtained at autopsy all grew um, at 48 hours, uh, a Obsidia cornibifera, um, and it had a classic uh, morphology. And we were lucky enough to actually go next door to our microbiology laboratory, which is, uh, and this is actually a photograph I took uh, sitting, as you can see, the sunlight coming in through the window, and that's the, the um, the organism, um, uh, the uh, fungal, which has that sort of fine uh, pin-like consistency. And this is again, a picture of our organism, which has the, um, the classic uh, piriform uh, sporangial and the uh, conical shaped uh, columella uh, of, the, uh, of the organism and it was identified. Um, and so the cause of death was determined to be disseminated angioinvasive zygomycosis due to obsidia cornambifera infection with resultant multi-organ failure. Uh, and thank you very much. And these are just some low, uh, very badly taken photographs through my iPhone. So please, if you're coming to Sydney, uh, you, um, you'll see much better and clearer uh, vision than this. Thank you so much, Vanavi, for this great case, uh, also for the kind invitation to Sydney that I would like to accept. But uh, let's uh, move on. I don't, don't, I don't think that Tanya Roden should be presented, but it's my pleasure to tell only some words about her. Dr. Roden is a professor of laboratory medicine and pathology and is a board certified anatomic and clinical pathologist with a special interest in thoracic pathology. After training in general surgery and working in basic immunology science, she completed her anatomic and clinical pathology residency, surgical pathology fellowship, and pulmonary Mayo Clinic scholarship at Mayo Clinic Rochester in the US. Subsequently, she joined the staff of the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic Rochester, and Dr. Roden also serves as the medical director of the Immunostains Laboratory, the Pulmonary Pathology Fellowship Director, and the head of the Thoracic Transplant Section. So please, uh, Anya. Thank you so much, Francesca. And thank you so much, Dr. Siva, for presenting this remarkable case. And it also underscores why autopsies are so important in this patient population so that we actually can learn from it. And I wanted to use this case to actually discuss what kind of unexpected findings we may see in post-transplant lung biopsies or autopsies. We know that lung transplanted patients have still a lower median outcome than other solid organ transplant uh, recipients. So for instance, the lung, these patients only have a median overall survival of 6.7 years in contrast to heart, lung transplant recipient, heart transplant recipients who have a median overall survival of at least 12.4 years. Leading causes of death in adult lung transplant recipients are infection within the first year after transplantation, as Dr. Siva also had presented to us. And after one year, the main cause of death is really chronic lung allograft dysfunction, specifically obliterative bronchiolitis. But these patients, of course, can also get malignancies or cardiovascular incidents. Invasive fungal infections are not uncommon. Their incidence is described between 4 and 16 percent in the first year post-transplantation. And this range probably depends on what kind of prophylaxis and preemptive therapy was given and whether or not anastomotic complications were included in the study. Also, it has a quite high mortality with 8 to 22 percent of patients dying after three months after having an with an invasive fungal infection. In the studies, Aspergillus and Candida were the most common fungal infections that uh, ended up with invasion. But as you could see, Psychomyces, of course, can also happen. 
Now, usually if we get an allocraft specimen from the lung, we think about rejection. We think about acute rejection, antibody mediated rejection, chronic rejection, and any signs that could suggest chronic lung allocraft dysfunction. But there are actually many more features that we can see and that sometimes come to us as a surprise. So, for instance, here on the upper left-hand side, this was a surprise herpes simplex virus infection. You can see the uh, uh, cellular viral inclusions in a background of necrotizing pneumonitis. On the upper right-hand side, this is CMV infection with the nuclear and cytoplasmic inclusions with CMV pneumonitis. And the lower pictures are from a patient who was transplanted one and a half years before she contracted COVID and died of COVID pneumonia. You can appreciate here the hyaline membranes with uh, diffuse alveolar damage and on the right side, the organizing pneumonia. Of course, uh, lung transplant recipients have a higher uh, risk of being aspirating. And here is aspiration material that's formed by the material over here. Over here, the patient made had a stake. This is a skeletal muscle, and that is surrounded by neutrophils. However, we also can see donor-derived abnormalities. And here on the lower hand, there is this material, which is actually polarizable, associated with some macrophages in the interstitium right next to capillaries. This is actually IV talcosis. And in that patient, it was seen in the first biopsy, which was one month after transplant. So it's actually thought to be donor derived. And then in this patient who had a single lung trans transplantation, here is the native lung where you can appreciate emphysema with fibrosis. There was actually at autopsy a surprise three centimeter nodule, which turned out to be squamous cell carcinoma. Here you can appreciate the dyskeratotic features and the malignant cells. Of course, we think about post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder that is usually characterized by these the diffuse cellular infiltrates. In this case, the cells were quite large, discohesive, had prominent nucleoli, and were positive for CD38, 138, for uh, they were lambda restricted, and they were positive for EBV. So this was a post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder, plasma cytoid, lambda restricted, and EBV associated. We may also see uh, pulmonary arterial thromboemboli, as you can appreciate here, with the typical triangular shape of a pulmonary infarct. So besides uh, rejection, we can see a lot of other findings in these lung allocrafts, including, as Dr. Siva presented, infection, but also aspiration, ischemia reperfusion injury, abnormal medication reaction, thromboemboli, malignancies, donor-related issues, recurrent disease, here specifically sarcoid and lymphangiomyomatosis, and diseases that may be associated with the native lung if there was a single lung transplant. In summary, we do need to consider conditions other than rejection. Therefore, we need to carefully and generously sample, for instance, autopsy lungs. And there should be always a discussion with the clinical care team, follow up with infectious uh, disease and with um, infectious workup. And so just be aware of some nasty fungi. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anya, because you focused on very, very important aspects uh, in the management of patients. Uh, so I would like to, to ask only a question to Vanity. I don't know if you have any ancillary tool, any ancillary technique to confirm this kind of infection. I don't know, a type of molecular approach, uh, sequencing or real time. I don't know what you have in your lab to confirm, if you have. Yes, well, uh, this autopsy was done uh, a few years ago when I was a, 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 an earlier tra a junior trainee, but now all of our um, uh, organisms are sent for fungal PCR and for dis definitive uh, identification. Um, but at the time, it was, um, it was prior to 2000, uh, 2010, so it was, uh, um, but at the time. Yes, sure. I don't know by the audience if someone has uh, some curiosity about this interesting case. Professor Goddard? This is a fascinating case. I try to work out exactly what happened here. Um, so we know that she probably got a venous infarction of the lung 
and a twisted pulmonary vein, which is quite difficult with an atrial cuff, um, but not impossible. And presumably that's why they're on heparin. And presumably that's why they get hit, which is presumably why they got thrombosis. And then they get a fungus. But where did that come from? Do you think the fungus was the starting point? Or do you think the fungus actually started off as colonization because they've got infarcted lung tissue and has then become an invasive disease, which has been impressively rapid, I have to say, and very well disseminated. I've never seen anything like this. And to be honest, I've never heard of the fungus either, but that's my own personal ignorance. So I just wonder what we think when, because if we trace this back to me, this is a problem that arose because the venous anastomosis was compromised. Um, and then there's been a sequence of events that has led to this tragic outcome and a fascinating set of findings that have come from that. But I just wonder whether that sort of is, is a, um, a fair clinical assessment. I don't know. Um, so I think certainly um, when we uh, discussed it, um, uh, at the uh, meeting, I think the, the second uh, idea that maybe there was that ischemic time and probably a donor, the organism was already within the donor and allowed it to, um, the organism to proliferate. The, the diagnosis of HITS, um, we're not sure, you know, given that she was probably septic, um, from a criteria point of view at the time, it was given the diagnosis of HITS, but I think um, whether there was a contribu contribution by the fact that she was probably quite septic as well. So that um, I think threw everybody off a little bit, having that the fact that she had the um, the positive antibodies. Um, but I think that that a little bit of ischemic time was enough. Uh, but I, I must admit in, in the last 10 years, I've had one other autopsy, which had a similar, um, a similar sort of outcome, similar findings. And that was about 10 years later. And I was doing it with my registrar. And when I looked at it, I, I sort of had this deja vu of, oh, it, it looked very similar when we opened up the, the chest cavity, um, but I hadn't seen uh, many others that had sort of rapidly deteriorated like this. No, I think it seems to be quite clinically appropriate or reasonable that this started off as an anastomotic complication and then thrombotic episodes arising due to HIT because that was the evidence you had clinically. Um, um, so, you know, as you unfolded your presentation, I, my, I, my, my jaw just dropped. It was quite, quite amazing. So thank you. I've seen in the chat that um, Dr. Chan asked if the patient received the injection with the thymoglobulin, but I've seen that uh, maybe no is the answer. Uh, I'm not 100% sure. I would think it'd probably be no, but... Um... Yes, Dr. Glanville answered. And, and oh, stated. excellent. Oh, yes. And, I, and I am also would know the case. How quickly this, it seems like in your presentation, this evolved very rapidly. And you did mention the BAL and the identification of the organism. Was that, it was on a BAL, was that from the donor or the recipient um, previously? So in other words, was this donor transmitted or was it from the recipient on a, like the pre-transplant BAL. We, you're muted. My apologies, I'm terrible with the with the technology. Um, the all of the BALs, even post-transplant, the uh, initially didn't grow any fungus at all. It was really only that uh, when I when we looked that very last BAL, which was taken just prior to her death, and it was actually mostly the tissue um, that we sampled at the time of autopsy, the pleural fluid and the the lung. Um, but the, the initial BALs didn't actually grow any fungal organisms. And it wasn't present in the explants from the original no. patient. No. So this was kind of donor transmitted. I think that we have to go on. I would like only to read the last um, comment in the chat because Dr. Marbo uh, underlined a very important aspect that is the importance of the evaluation of the explanted recipient lung. So it is a crucial point uh, that we have always uh, to take in mind. Indeed, uh, also he had uh, an, another similar case uh, resulted from Aspergillus broadly disseminating uh, at the time of lung explant from a lung abscess in a CF patient. So this was also fatal up at 10 days post-transplant. So it is a, a very important point that we have 
always to take in mind. So I think that we we have uh, unfortunately to move on uh, with the third case because the time is going fast. Thank you. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce the next presenter, uh, Velasini Rekpichaisut from the Mahidol University in Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, Dr. Rekpichaisut Rick, Rick, Rick received her medical degree in 2014 from the, the uh, Faculty of Medicine Siviraj Hospital in Bangkok, where she subsequently completed an anatomic pathology residency and ultimately joined the uh, faculty uh, and was an instructor in 2017. Currently, I have the pleasure with working with her. She's completing a one-year observership in thoracic pathology at the University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, and subsequently, she will be completing another observership at Mass General Brigham in Boston, Massachusetts. So without further ado, I will turn the stage over to Velocity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, can you just like see my screen? Yes. Yeah, hi. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, Dr. Fishby, for letting me present this case from UCLA. Uh, the patient is a 70-year-old male with history of ankylosing spondylitis. He presented with breathlessness, dyspnea on exertion, and dry cough, and then was diagnosed with interstitial lung disease. He is a never smoker. He spent many years working on making guitar with exposure to wound dust and uh, pain material without PPE for several years. He reported uh, his symptoms did not improve after temporarily discontinuing his work. Uh, he was treated by prednisolone and oxygen supportive treatment, and he was hospitalized for progressive hypoxemic respiratory failure. The chest CT showed diffuse severe lower low predominant ground glass opacities at both lungs with basilar predominant reticulations, uh, architectural distortion with honeycombing and traction bronchiectasis. The CT findings suggest non-specific interstitial pneumonia or an SIP pattern. He underwent single left lung transplantation uh, at around three years after his presentation. And the explant pathology diagnosis was fibrotic and SIP pattern, also reported to have market honeycomb change, lower low predominant, and patchy peribronchiolar metaplasia and airway fibrosis. Here are post transplant lung biopsies, uh, negative for rejection at one month. B, uh, A1 minimal AQ rejection, BXCX with disquamative uh, interstitial pneumonia or the IV light accumulation of, of macrophages at two months, and AXBXCX ungradable rejection status due to obscuring inflammation with DIP light features at four months as well. The patient had abnormal CT after transplantation, although he felt well overall. And here is the upper part of chest CT, and this is right native lung, and it is a left lung allograph. There is some faint centric lobular ground glass nodularity in the left lung, and the native right lung show fibrosis and a centric lobular ground glass nodularity as well. Here is the middle to lower part of the CT with continuation of the centric lobular ground glass nodularity uh, and the development of some subpleural fibrotic changes in the posterior area of the left lung. The native right lung show extensive fibrosis with peripheral and lower low uh, predominant reticulation here. So we have a uh, ground glass opacity in the left allograph uh, with conspicuous centric lobular ground glass nodularity in the right native lung and extensive fibrotic change in the right native lung. And here we come to our specimen. It is a left lower lobe transbronchial lung biopsy at seven months post transplant. From the low power, there is extensive alveolar filling by cellular component here. And here we can see the intra-alveolar accumulation of numerous uh, smokers, histiocytes, appearing as cell with eosinophilic cytoplasm with light brown phyllic granular uh, pigments. 
the interstitium show fibrotic thickening with mild chronic inflammatory cell infiltrate, and we can see scattered multinucleated giant cells. A lot of giant cells are stuck on the alveolar septa and here and here, and some giant cells are floating in the alveolar space here and here. And again, we can see that the, uh, the giant cells lining the ovular septa here, and some giant cells are in the ovular spaces, but right here and here. In this figure, in addition to the giant cell here, we also see increased uh, eosinophilic cyto, uh, sorry, eosinophilic infiltrates here and here. Uh, this is higher magnification of the interstitial eosinophil here and alveolar eosinophils. And here there are the cells inside these giant cells consistent with empiricolysis or cannibalism. CK7 is positive in the giant cell stuck on the alveolar septa here, supporting that these giant cells are of epithelial origin. TTF1 is also positive in this uh, giant cell here, supporting our pneumocytic origin. And this is CD68. Uh, it is negative for those giant cells at the alveolar septa, but uh, positive in the giant cells in the alveolar space. So from the morphology and immunohistochemistry, we have to kinds of cyan cells. One is uh, pneumocytic origin and the other is histiocytic origin. So from the findings of epithelial and histiocytic cyan cells, DIP-like features, eosinophils, and interstitial fibrosis, uh, we think this case is compatible with cyan cell interstitial pneumonia or DIP, a pattern of parenchymal lung disease associated with heart metal exposure. Uh, the presence of the rejection cannot uh, be evaluated due to background interstitial pneumonia. At this point, we went back to review the left lung expand specimen, which was initially diagnosed as fibrotic NSIP. Uh, at that time, we thought that it may be uh, associated with his underlying disease of connective tissue disease. Uh, we saw that the lung show extensive fibrosis and somosis, predominant at periphery and the uh, lower lobe. The section shows diffuse interstitial thickening due to the fibrosis compatible with fibrotic and SIP pattern. But, but uh, in addition, we retrospectively saw alveolar accumulation by macrophages in some areas. Here are DIP light macrophage accumulation uh, with some giant cell here, which we also saw in the explant specimen as well. These are giant cells lining the alveolar septa, and these are intra-alveolar giant cells here, similar to what we have seen in the post-transplant biopsy. And here are empiripolysis. And this is subplural fibrosis with cystic chains consistent with honeycomb change. So this patient was diagnosed at uh, GIP at seven months post-transplant, but actually he had GIP since before the transplantation. We went back to review the post-transplant biopsies before the diagnostic one as well and found that those DIP like features at two months and four months also show very scanned giant cell. Uh, the DIP recur after the transplantation, which was kind of surprising to us. The patient spent many years working on making electric guitars. We were wondering that uh, he might expose to, to hard metal materials during his occupation, like from guitars, strings, or uh, his equipment, or it may be idiopathic, we not sure. Uh, he still worked for a while after his transplantation, but after GIP was diagnosed, he retired and stopped making guitars recently. So uh, that's it for my case presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Velocity. That's uh, 
Very impressive. Uh, so now I'll introduce the discussant, Dr. Martin Goddard, who needs no introduction, from Papworth Hospital, Cambridge, UK. Dr. Goddard received his medical education from Oxford Medical School and St. Catherine's College in the UK. And for the last 27 years, he has been a consultant cardiorespiratory histopathologist at Royal Papworth Hospital in Cambridge. He is the clinical lead for cardiac pathology, including cardiac transplantation, uh, and the business unit lead for pathology and chairman of the National Cardiac Pathology Network. He has provided extensive service to the ICHLT and is the current treasurer. Uh, so if any of you haven't paid your dues yet, <laughs> you can stick around afterwards and talk to him about that. Uh, and he is a member of the board of directors. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Goddard. Greg, thank you for that, that generous introduction. So I'm not going to prepare slides for this. I'm going to just talk through. So I think there's a number of interesting facets about this. So one is the, the explant diagnosis and how we get there. And two is the findings in the biopsy. Um, obviously these days in interstitial lung disease, the diagnostic services are heavily, heavily reliant on radiology uh, to make a diagnosis. And I think they're highly well served, but there's always a reluctance to undertake biopsies on patients to actually refine the diagnosis. And perhaps when you have a patient who is in end-stage respiratory failure, who's going to have a transplant anyway, does it actually matter? Um, but I think there is still a place for pathology in the diagnosis of interstitial lung disease. And at times it is being underlooked because of this dependence on radiology. I cannot think of a case personally where a finding in a biopsy has led me to review my explant pathology diagnosis. Um, this is unique in my experience. I don't know whether colleagues elsewhere have resorted to this or not, but I don't know. Um, when I looked at the radiology, and I want my colleagues to look at it, and obviously it's not a full set. Yes, it would be in keeping with NSIP, but it's not entirely typical. So there are a few flags that wave on that to do so. Um, I think the mixed pattern of both the UIP-like end-stage fibrosis and NSIP-like pattern of interstitial fibrosis in areas is entirely in keeping with the giant cell um, interstitial pneumonitis. You tend to see a much more UIP-like pattern with um, heavy metal disease-related um, uh, giant cell interstitial pneumonitis, and that may be the underlying cause, although his um, occupational history is not entirely typical um, for somebody with a heavy metal disease related lung disease. Um, so uh, it's questionable as to whether that's the case. Uh, I also think that given that he has got allegedly recurrent disease after only seven months makes the occupational cause probably unlikely. So this really falls into the group of an idiopathic giant cell interstitial pneumonitis, um, which is um, well recognized and there are a few reported cases of recurrence within transplantation. Um, I'm not sure how many people actually went back and checked, but anyway, <laughs> that was it. And the telling thing about this is, is you've got a mixed pattern of giant cells, which are both within the epithelium and within the um, uh, alveolar spaces. The alveolar spaces ones do tend to be macrophage type giant cells. And when we see those in transplant biopsies, our first thought is not to giant cell interstitial pneumonitis, I can tell you. We're more often concerned about aspiration, um, which is common post-transplantation. We know it's associated with a poor outcome. Many of the Duke University studies uh, led by Duane um, uh, demonstrated that, and it's not uncommon. Epithelial giant cells are relatively uncommon within the lung. Um, most of them are driven by infection um, and you can see giant cells associated with HSV, but they're usually associated with airways rather than parenchyma. You usually have neutrophilic infiltrates, not eosinophils, and are associated with necrosis. Uh, you can see giant cells associated with uh, CMV, of course, but again, we would expect to see the typical um, nuclear inclusions associated with that. Other viral infections are associated with giant cells, in particular, parainfluenza 3 can cause epithelial giant cells uh, within the lung. Um, I've only ever seen one case of that within a lung transplant biopsy where we identified that, and I had a much more lymphocytic rather than eosinophilic infiltrate associated with it. The eosinophils are interesting because they do seem to be the, the predominant cell type uh, looking at the images there. So 
I think this is an interesting case. It highlights one, the importance of lung biopsies in interstitial lung disease, whether that would have changed the clinical trajectory for this patient, I think is highly unlikely. If the patient needs a transplant, they need a transplant and it wouldn't affect the outcome afterwards. I think the thought to go back and review the explant pathology is highly commendable. And I, I think not many of us would be brave enough to go and do that and then present it in an international <laughs> webinar. <laughs> so I think there's that. I think the findings in the biopsy are intriguing with a mixture of macrophage and um, epithelial giant cells. I said infection is the most likely underlying cause in the absence of anything else. But I would agree that I think this is a giant cell interstitial pneumonitis that has recurred within the graft. And um, it's highly unusual, but is recognized. And I think it's been a fascinating presentation. So my thanks to the presenters and my, my thanks to Greg and Francesca for inviting me to comment. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Uh about this interesting case? I don't see anything in the chat. Okay, uh, there's a question. What studies were done to address infection? Velocity, do you wanna answer that question? I think I can speak to that a little bit. Um, all of our uh, biopsies uh, have contemporaneous BALs that are uh, extensively tested with PCR, and um, and we have a, a large viral respiratory panel, uh, also CMV and other specific things. So um, the BALs and they they go for culture routinely. So um, so PCR and cultures on the on the concurrent BAL. Uh, and then there's another question that uh, was there symptomatic change in the patient post transplant or fall in PFTs? Any radiographic changes? Uh, sorry, this is something's blocking my view here. Or was this uh, picked up on surveillance bronchoscopy? Uh, post transplant, the patient feeling well, but uh, she has CT show abnormality and. So it, it's not a surveillance biopsy. We did that because the abnormal CT changes. And uh, I also saw that in some specimen, we did AFB and JMS as well, in addition to the microbiology study and no evidence of infection in this patient. I'll add one more thing that the patient uh, recently had uh, serologic testing for cobalt done and it, it came back negative. Any other questions? All right, well, I think uh, that about wraps it up. I hope to see uh, you at the annual meeting.